Amen. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 2, Psalm 2, that'll be our sermon text this evening. Um, just want to like give you a few points of information about it. And as I was studying in this week, it's pretty interesting that these, these first two Psalms form something of a prologue as they set the main themes for, on the one hand, what it is to be a godly man or a godly person and living in a world where they rage against the Lord and also the ultimate downfall, the derision in which the Lord holds the nations and he'll bring them under his feet. But ultimately, that the blessing of a Christian is that they find their refuge in the Lord in submission to his word. And those sorts of themes continue on throughout the whole of the Psalter and they govern every uh, major themes of it because they repeat themselves again and again of where do we find our hope and stay. And there are some psalms, some scholars who do see verses or psalms one and two. At one point, it was one psalm altogether. And a lot of that has to do with both how Psalm 1 begins and how Psalm 2 ends. You know, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, or even in verse in uh, chapter 2 and how it ends, blessed are all who take refuge in him. And it tells us, it's communicating us to what is a blessed man, what makes one happy in the Lord. And we'll see some of that again tonight in the different ways he moves from Psalm 1 from an individual level here in Psalm 2 to a more corporate level. Now, with some of that background information in mind, let's look at Psalm 2 and hear it read. Um, and this is God's word. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, be, now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. That sends the reading of God's word. Let us seek his uh, blessing before his throne of grace. Father, we thank you again tonight for the opportunity to close the day out studying your word. And I pray, Father, that we would hear from you, that we would know what it is to be blessed, to be happy in our Lord. And I pray, Father, that you will write these truths on our hearts, that what we take from here, that you will help us to live and grow closer to you. And so, therefore, Father, I pray that the very words of my mouth and the very meditations of our heart will be holy and acceptable in your sight. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, I am pretty sure most of you, at, when you were in grade school, high school, whatever it might have been, probably took civics classes. And uh, being the good students that you were, you probably passed them with flying colors. Now, I say all of that because I, you should know from your civics classes that our chief executive, the leader of our nation, is a president. And we elect him every four years. We elect him at most to two terms, and, and that's just sort of how we do things. But for a long time in the world, that's not how it always has been. In fact, we're actually the, one of the first countries never to have a monarch to begin with. But that wasn't always so. In fact, from the very beginning of America's days, there, there was a large number of the population that were what was called loyalists and that during the Revolutionary War, they were particularly loyal to the King of England. And even after America broke free from the, from the bonds of the British, from the rule of the King of England, there were even still suggestions about America having a monarch, that, king, that uh, President George Washington would be that first king. The only stipulation being this, that he could rule for life, but he could be elected out. And so long as he behaved himself and was a good leader or a good king, he could reign for however long he wished. But if he didn't, he could be elected out. Now, that obviously isn't how it panned out. 
Uh, most Americans at that time and even today just eschew the idea of having a king. We don't want one. And yet at the same time, there's still a degree of fascination with royalty. There's a, de- there's a degree of fascination with having kings and queens. And you see that particularly with how we fawn, how sometimes some Americans will fawn over the British royal family. Like we all love Queen Elizabeth. And for a time in the 90s, we all loved the marriage of Princess Diana and Prince, Prince Charles as they were the, you know, the heir apparents. They were the, they were the Cinderella story, as it were, of one who would one day rule as a mighty king with his queen. But like that, that sort of news fascination captivates both America, Americans and the English today. And yet it's really interesting that we get fascinated with one, and yet we don't actually have a king. And there are a number of reasons for that. We like the idea of being able to elect our own leaders. We like the idea of being able to have a say in our own elected choices or elected officials. And we see all of that, and we have to ask ourselves the question then, if this is how we, man- how we rule and govern ourselves, how does that then teach us to relate to a king, maybe even to the king, to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not just any, any old king that the nations have, but the only king, the true king, the one that we all must at some level submit to and will submit to one day whether we wish to submit to a king or not. Like, how do we relate to him? How does he govern our lives? Does he govern our lives? Do we submit to him? How do we submit to him? A lot of these questions are what the second psalm is going to answer for us. The psalm is principally about a king. It's one of those coronation psalms that you see that you see throughout the entirety of the Psalter. And in fact, when you get to the passage in verse 7 of Psalm chapter 2, it says, I will tell of the decree, that's kingly language, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. It's hearkening back to uh, the Lord's words to David. You know, he said, you'll have a son, and I, I'll be like a father to him. And because of him, because of that, I will never leave someone off of your throne. Now that's obviously with special reference to King Solomon, because that son would ultimately build a place for God to dwell among his people. And if you were at Reedville this morning, or if I had had an opportunity to read it, we would read from Acts chapter 4, where they give commentary on this, that that son, that blessed son, the only begotten one, is principally about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the psalm establishes for us that we may not have a king, we may not even have an elected king, but there is a king, and that king is the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that we learn in this psalm that there is a king that we must submit to. Submitting to the anointed king is the way to true peace. True peace in a world where, as the psalmist says, there are nations that rage against him. And if we wish to have peace in the world, submitting to the, king, to the anointed king is the way to true peace. Submitting to the anointed king is the way to true peace. And we'll see that in three ways. The first thing we need to see in verses 1 to 3 is who opposes the king. There are people who oppose him. Second, we'll see in verses 4 to 9 who the king is. And in the third place, we'll see how we are to relate to the king in verses 10 to 12. So who opposes him, who the king is, and then how to relate to him. Let's, uh, we'll unpack that first idea, idea then in, uh, in verses 1 to 3 of who opposes him. And we see very clearly that that's the nations. It says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Uh, it's actually pretty interesting that the nations here and the peoples are pretty accurately defined in the, in the book of Psalms, or at least in the, the book of Acts, as being the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Why is that significant at all? It's pretty significant because it's, Jesus Christ, that one seed that God promised from the very foundation of the world, from the very promise that he made to Abraham, that it is through that seed that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. If you go back and you read in Genesis chapter 12, it's, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, and through you, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And it's for him, it's for that covenant sign that will ultimately, that covenant promises that God makes to Abraham, that it's through him all the families, all the nations will be blessed. And in uh, Genesis chapter 15, he says that nations will come from you. And there are nations that come from Abraham, aren't there? You see, the, see, he had another son. He didn't just have Isaac, he had Ishmael. And the descendants of Ishmael are, as we know, the, the Arab people, nations, the people of Canaan. All of those who are of Arab descent still to this day claim their ancestry back to Abraham. And of course we know from Galatians is what Paul says 
that that one seed would reconcile all people, all Gentiles to himself, and that all the nations would be called, who have faith in Christ, would be called sons of Abraham. Now, if that's the promise, then why are they raging at it? Why are they raging at the one, at the, at the king himself? They're raging at him because this is a world dominated and cursed by sin. It's been that way since the very foundation of the world from the fall onward. We are completely dominated by sin. And in fact, we are such that our whole hearts and our whole minds are set against him. They take counsel on how to undermine him. And, and that's what he says in verse, in verse, cha- verse 2 of chapter 2. Now, when it says there in verse 1, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain, it's very interesting that the type of people and nations that he's talking about here that are working against him, that they're plotting in vain, it's actually the same word that's inadvertently characterizing the blessed man. If you go back in, into Psalm 1 and you read in verse 2, what's the blessed man? He doesn't walk, walk in this way, he doesn't stand in that way or sit in the other seat. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates on it day and night. He's thinking thinking and saturating himself with God's word, thinking on how it applies to him, how it it should relate to God, how he should be, be blessing God and blessing others and blessing his people and blessing the nations. But here, what you see in verse 1 of chapter 2 is that they're plotting in vain. They're plotting ways in which they can undermine both the Lord himself and his Christ. And that's what he says in verse 2, that they are take, that they're setting themselves and rulers are taking counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. There's a sort of parallelism there that you see in verse 2, that what they're taking, against, taking counsel against is the Lord and his anointed. It's pretty, pretty interesting there that the word for anointed there is Mashiach, or translated into Greek, Christos, or in English, Christ. They set themselves up against the Lord. They set themselves up against his Christ. They sent him up against the very Son of God. And know what they say. Let us burst their bond apart and cast away their cords from us. If you can think back to a point in the Gospels where Jesus says, you know, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What, it, what does that mean? What is Jesus giving that in a context for? He's giving that in a context in which he's saying, you know, he's, he's preaching the true meaning of the law. He's saying, you know, you, you, you hate someone in your heart. You've broken the sixth commandment of thou shalt not kill. You lust after a woman or man in your heart, and you've already committed adultery with them in that way, and you've already broken the seventh commandment. He raises and heightens the law then. But at the same time, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because Jesus Christ took the very curse and burden of the law on himself, the dying the death that we so most definitely deserve for our sin. He bore that in our place. The yoke and the burden that the Pharisees were placing on the people through man-made traditions and and rules and and rights and regulations, Jesus Christ said, you know, we'll have none of that, but I give you something that you truly desperately need. You need the freedom, the forgiveness from the curse of the sin and law so that you don't have to be bound to, to man-made laws. You're free in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what the nations are raging against, they're believing that whole lie of Satan that Satan used to deceive our, our first parents in the Eden where he says, did God really say? And what's behind the question? Behind that question that Satan is raising is he's saying, God doesn't have your best interests at heart. God doesn't care about you. He wants to keep you down. And more than that, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want, he thinks that in the day that you eat of it, you'll be like God, you'll know like him, you'll be as powerful as him. And Satan used that to deceive Adam and Eve to sow pain and misery unlike the world has ever seen. He's saying to them basically, if you break God's law, if you break God's word, then you'll be free. And that's what the nations are raging against. They are raging against the one who is seeking above all to not undermine just God, but his Christ, his people, and so therefore rend his people away from him, to tear down his kingdom if he can. And the nations believe that. The nations believe that if they're going to have any sort of freedom to be able to be the masters of their own ships, to sort of set the agenda for their lives, then, and, to, and to say, you know, it's my way or the highway, then I must be free from Christ. It's too hard, it's too heavy, it's too burdensome. And the sort of person that says that is the sort of person who doesn't understand the law or the gospel inadvertently anyway. So they rage. They want to be free, but ultimately to their peril and to their shame. 
Now, there's at least one lesson here for us. And that what's true of the nations is also true of us as well. And that our hearts tend to rage against the Lord as well. We still have hearts. That there's, that there's a sense in which our hearts rage against the Lord as well. Why is that? Well, because, I mean, I mean, I don't know about any of you, but I don't think that I necessarily always like being told what to do. I don't like being told that my way is wrong and that someone else's way is right. I was reading a book this past week called Counterfeit Gods by Tim Keller, and one of the things that Keller brought out in that book is that what th- th- this sort of thinking is someone who's already set an idol in their heart. Idols, where, having a place in one's hearts where God truly should be. And the reason why that's important is because, and you know, you may say, well, we don't worship idols today. Well, we, we, we actually do. We like to have something to control. We like to have something that tells us, you know, you know, your way is okay. And that's what the world thinks about Jesus. You know, everybody else in the world has this idea of Jesus of being a God of love. He's a God of grace. He's a God of compassion. He wouldn't, he wouldn't dare tell me, tell me what I can and cannot do. He loves me. He'll never condemn me. And the world believes that. And so they set that sort of idol up in their hearts. They set up other idols as well. They set themselves. They set up their families. They set up their careers. Money, which Jesus actually addresses the issue of greed more often than he addresses a lot of other sins in the Gospels. That, that sort of idea that, you know, you know, my money is the Lord's money. It's a trust that he gave to me. And so that the Lord's money is re- so that my money is really the Lord's money, and whatever I get, whatever I give to the church should be free and full, according to not just the bare minimum of what He tells me, but even to the very extent possible that I can give as a free will offering. Because I know that what He's going to use with that is for the furthering of the gospel. I know what He's going to do with that is for for gospel ministry, for planting churches, for supporting missionaries, or for supporting RUF, or whatever it might be. He's using that and saying, if you're, if you're saying with, with your money or your family or, your, or even your own life that this is mine and I can't let anybody have it, that's an idol. And the idea that we're told that and we're told to crucify those idols, to destroy them, as the Bible says, you shall have no other God before me. We rage, saying that that's just not true of me. And yet what the psalmist is saying, that is true. It's true of everybody. Believers, unbelievers alike. But the difference should be that believers know and they should recognize that and seek to crucify the sins of the flesh that would set up idols in our hearts where Christ should be. So we all have our idols. We all have raging against God whenever we are told we must do something we don't want to do, like forgiving people. Like saying that, you know, there's a debt that you owe me, but I'm going to absorb it. I'm going to bear it and seek to assert a right relationship with you. That's true forgiveness and not holding on on their count. But the idea of being told that, especially when someone's hurt us really bad, we tend to rage. And yet the attitude of a Christian is to say, you know, if I'm going to trust Christ, if I'm going to submit to him, my heart should not rage against him because his way is right, it's true, it's good, and it's the only way that leads to life. So we see that there are nations that rage. But in the second place, we need to see not just those who oppose the king, but second, we need to see who this king is. We've already made some allusions to it already, but we'll unpack it a little more here in verses 4 to 9 on who the king is. Now, he is the king. Verse 6, it says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. He's the one who sits in heaven. He laughs. He holds the nations in derision. And we'll come back to that here in a moment of the one who sits in the heavens and laughs and holds him in derision. But the reason why I want to tell you that there's a king here that the nations are opposing, the king of glory, the king of heaven, is because of what he says here in verse 6. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now he defines it to some extent what Zion is, my holy hill, but but there's obviously certainly more meaning to uh, what Zion actually is. So what is Zion? Zion throughout the entirety of the Bible generally almost exclusively means that place where God is present. Uh, you know, you're, you're talking about Mount, Mount Zion where the, the Lord had his temple, where the Lord had the tabernacle, where the Lord's presence was. 
And wherever the Lord was among his people, there was Zion. There was where God was with his people. In fact, in Revelation, there's a, there's a place uh, of God's placing with his people where he'll say, they will be with me forever and I will be their God and they will be my people. Uh, there will be no more crying, tears, or pain there, for the former things will have gone away. There's a sense in which Zion is both the place where God is with us, and yet he's also above us. You know, God doesn't live in tabernacles made by human hands. He doesn't walk across the street, as in we can say, hey, how are you doing? That's not where he's at. He is in heaven. That is Zion, as it were, in a spiritual sense. That's where he's at. But he's reigning from there as a prophet, priest, and most importantly, as a king. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, for example, uh, Jesus, it is said there that Jesus, he's raised to the right hand, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father on high, reigning as a king, reigning over you and me, over his kingdom, over his church. And from there, look what it says in verse 4 and 5, he laughs. He holds them in derision, and he's eventually going to visit them in his wrath and fury. So we'll work through that here in a second to say, what does it mean that he's laughing at them as he's holding them in derision? Is he laughing at them simply because of their condition, their sinful condition? Well, we know that's not true because in 2 Peter chapter 2 or 3, or maybe it's in 1 Peter, whichever one it is, it says that the Lord does not take delight in the death of the wicked, but wishes that all should come to repentance. He's not laughing at them in terms of their sinful condition, but he's laughing at them with respect to, you know, what kind of arrogance does it take to believe that me, the king of all the earth, who sits high in the heavens from my holy hill, I look out at you at all the other hills. If I needed anything, I wouldn't ask you because everything is mine. I am the king. I am the king of glory is what he's saying. And how, how could you possibly think that you could rule your own life? How is it that you could possibly think that you're going to somehow find life, find right rule apart from me? And if you do that, he's, he's saying there in verse 5 very clearly that I'll speak to them in my wrath and terrify them with my fury. He's going to greet them with judgment. He's going to greet them with judgment. And they're going to wish, the nations will, that they had followed the king. You know, there was... Um, a proclamation when King Charles the Third was crowned king. Um, you know, it went something like this. You know, I here proclaim to you, King Charles the Third. He's the undoubted king of England. He's the undoubted king of England, and I'm now going to say, do you pay homage to the king? Uh, you know, you know, in ancient times when the British Empire was still a, an actual threat, you might would say, oh yes, I will definitely pay homage to the king. We probably don't now because the monarchy in England's a figurehead. But what we know from this passage is that he's not a figurehead. If we know who the king is and we know what kind of power he is and we know what kind of greeting he's going to give us, we would do well to pay homage to that king. And he says, to, I, tell you, I will tell you this degree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. He's giving Christ Royal titles in this passage. He's calling him my son. I've begotten you. So that, that sort of idea from, from John chapter 3. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, Jesus has that special relationship of being eternally God's son. And as his son, he has a heritage. He has a nation. He has a world that he's coming to subdue to himself. Both his enemies... And by extension, the church's enemies as well. What's his inheritance? Look at verse 8 and 9. Ask of me, this is the Lord talking to Jesus, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. You see the sort of imagery that he's getting here. When you look at verses Verse 8, for example, and he says, I'll make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. It's so showing you the scope of Christ's rule over the earth. Now, some simply see it as a negative here, but I, I do think that there's a positive element here as well. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, generally, whenever the nations are talked about as the Lord's possession and his heritage, that's usually with respect to salvation. 
You know, in the Song of Moses, you know, that you see some of those same images. You know, you're my people. I gathered you under my wings like a mother's hen. You are my, the apple of my eye. I chose you above all the nations of the earth to be my portion, to be my heritage, to be my people of all the nations of the earth. It wasn't because you were great. It wasn't because you were mighty. It's because I am going to make my name great through you. And that's a blessing to believers. But in this context, it's most definitely an issue of judgment. Because for it to say, you know, the nation's your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession, he's not talking about it with respect to bless the nations that are raging against him. He's using it to say, your end is coming. Your end is coming. And not only that, he tells us how it will be. I'll dash them into pieces with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I don't know if you've ever held up a, an iron rod recently or a piece of iron. It's pretty heavy. It's pretty sturdy. It's pretty dense. It can, it can just about break anything, like this window over here. It could maybe even break uh, <laughs> uh, my car fender or something like that. I mean, like iron is pretty, pretty, pretty dense and pretty heavy. And like the image that he's giving here is something, something like, uh, like um, it's almost disintegrating. You know, pottery, if you've ever made it, you know that, you know, you, you want to, it, it's sturdy. It can be its own thing. You can set it down and it won't break. But if you throw it down and, and if you, you know, throw it out of a window, it's naturally going to do what? It's going to break. And so what Jesus is saying here, that this rod of iron that he's got is, I'm going to break it into a million pieces. It's going to be like dust. The nations are coming to an end. The nations that are at rage against God, the ones that are plotting against him in vain, they will come to an end. And that teaches us something very important too with respect to how it is that Christians relate to the world as the kingdom of God in the world today. And it's, and it's this. If we know that the, kingdom, if the kingdoms of this world are going to come to an end, what are we doing with it? How do we relate to them? We know how the king is going to relate to them. He's going to destroy it. So what are we to do? Um, I said, said this earlier this morning, but I'm going to say it later now. The, the truth is that the nations being as wicked and vile as they are shouldn't surprise us. I mean, it really shouldn't. Um, you know, you look at what's going on in the world, economic degradation, the LGBT movements moving in through, I mean, just, just any form of ungodliness is moving away, moving its way in the United States. It's, it's just parading itself. It's like, it's blasphemous. It's, 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 they've got a whole month to it now. And this, it's, it's almost like a big stiff to God. It's like, I will not bow the knee. But friends, that shouldn't surprise us. You know, at one time there was in this country what Francis Schaeffer in one of his books called a Christian Consensus. The, 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 the nations were Christianized, as it were. But they were not Christian. They were Christianized, but they were not Christian. And what do you think will ultimately stand? The Christian or the Christianized? The psalmist tells us very clearly who's going to, or at least in this case, who's not going to. It's both the ostensibly wicked and those who are Christianized who think they're Christians but really aren't. Everybody's going to say, you know, who, who was it? Lord, uh, you know, Lord, uh, someone's going to say before Christ one day, you know, Lord, Lord, uh, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not go visit people in prison in your name or heal or do all these things? It's like, you know, say, get away from me. I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. There will be people like that. And when we ask ourselves the question, and those things shouldn't surprise us, what are we building? We shouldn't merely be about the business of building Christian institutions. They will come to an end. And even in Christian institutions, they will come to an end. But the reality is, is this, that if in the very final analysis that with our kids, our grandkids, or even our neighbors, if all we give them is all that we have, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that even while there is a judgment, 
There is a way of escape, and that way of escape is through the one who came to bear the, pa- the wrath and fury of God the Father in your place, so that if you are standing in him complete, you have his righteousness, not your own, and you are judged based on Christ's righteousness, which is perfect. That's what we offer. That's what we're bringing to people. And if people come to Christ in the, in the interim, that's great. That's wonderful. But what we're building here in the people, among the people of God and the church of God is not, you know, strictly speaking, though they're good. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm saying they're good. But we're not simply about to be building Christian schools, Christian basketball even. We're here to make Christians. And we give them the one who is the true king. And he is Jesus Christ. And even when we know that this world is coming to its end, we know that the Lord is going to respond to the nations in fury. We see his offer in verses 10 to 12 as well. Because verses 10 to 12 teach us how to relate to the king. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. What he's moving in here to is not simply an offer of condemnation, but an offer of grace, an offer of mercy. He's saying, be wise and be warned. Make the right choice and know that if you don't, you know where you're going to end. And if you make the choice of the, of the righteous man, that I meditate on the law day and night, and I know that the way of the righteous that the Lord does, and that's the way to life, I can rejoice and live. Serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. So when we make those two, those two rules, when we make that decision of now therefore be wise, be warned, we have three things that we have to do. In verse 11 and 12, set them out. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. That first idea, serve the Lord. What's it mean? Very simply, we have, there, there is a degree to which we owe duties to him. He is the master of our ship. We serve him, not our idols. Christ is king in our hearts, and we serve him principally. We deny ourselves. We, we crucify the sins of our flesh because we don't, we don't do it merely because we're, we're afraid of what might happen. But we rejoice with fear knowing who he is, and we say with the psalmist, you know, it's, it's not just simply against you know, Dave, uh, it's not just simply against somebody else that I sinned, but it's against you and you only have I sinned. In serving the Lord, we are working to kill those sins of the flesh and that we might obey him and serve him and love him. Rejoice with trembling. You know, you say, well, trembling. It's knowing what he's going to do or what he can do. But we rejoice knowing that he won't do it to those who believe on the Son, on the Son Jesus Christ. So really, it's a call to live. Serve the Lord and live. Be wise, be warned, serve him and live. You will live if you, if you acknowledge the son. And like with King Charles, he tells us in verse 12 to kiss the son, which is really a call to pay homage. Um, if you look at verse 12 where it says kiss the son, in Hebrew it's actually pretty interesting that those words don't actually appear. It's something like an idiom. It's not really the best translation in the world, but be it here in the ESV that I have or the NIV like some of you may have, the basic meaning is the same. So we're to serve him, we're to rejoice in him, but we're also to pay homage to the king because we know his wrath, we know his angry, and we don't want to perish because he's given us the right way. He's given us the right way. And this is the free offer of the gospel, essentially, at its very basic level. You know, if like back in 2020, for example, when the COVID crisis was just beginning, if you remember President Trump getting up and he broadcasting to the whole nation the nature of the crisis and he's telling us on what to do, we were all glued to the TV and telling us what, what we needed to do with respect to that crisis. And even still, he's telling us exactly what to do here in this psalm, the Lord Jesus is. And that's to give us the way to life. There is judgment to come. But if you kiss the son and you acknowledge him, you won't have to endure the wrath. Because he went through the wrath. He endured it. He bore it on your behalf that you may have life. You may have life and life abundantly. Because he says, as he ends in verse 12, 
Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Not blessed are those who take refuge from him. Not apart from him, as the nations are saying, but those who take refuge in him, who find their life, their hope, that don't sit there and meditate on how to circumvent the Christian faith, that doesn't circumvent the Christian life in our hearts, but actually seeks to live in it, because that is the way to true peace. That is the way to true freedom. But if there is a final lesson for us to learn, that this idea of submitting to the king as the way to true peace there's one other thing that we should learn from this text here, and that is that we are to live our lives with humility. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And how do we do that? Jesus modeled that very clearly for us on what it is. In, Psalm, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he gave it up, taking on the form of a servant, and being obedient to the point of death, even a death on the cross, and the Father raised him up and highly exalted him above in the heavenlies, that at the very name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He glorified the one who is truly humble, who didn't just take the form of a servant, but took the form of a servant of a servant. He washed the disciples' feet, lowly, based work, for some people who didn't even deserve his grace, who didn't deserve his love, they deserved really his condemnation. But he came to serve them. And that affects how you serve others as well, not just those in the Christian communion, but those outside as well. Those who we consider as based or, or even, and not in a good way, as part of the modern lingo today, that base is a good thing. But those who we find as undesirable, hard to deal with, hard to live with. Maybe even they rebuff everything you do. But the way to true humility is taking on the form of a servant who even asked the Father in heaven to forgive those who were killing him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's our way as well. To kiss the Son to humble ourselves before him, to destroy the idols of our hearts, and to give our hearts to Christ. Knowing that if we do that, he will never leave us nor forsake us. He'll never disappoint us. He'll give you the way to life, and that's life in him. Any other way is going to destroy it. But that means we have to submit to the king. We need to oppose the king, but we need to serve him. We know who he is, and we respond to him in service. In America, we may have an elected official, but we do have the king to follow and serve, and he models for us what that kind of service is. If you want to have life and not perish, you're going to have to reconcile the fact that you're going to have to submit to someone, and that manifests itself in submitting to his call, even from his officers in the church. And opposing the Lord and his ways doesn't lead to life, but if you don't oppose him, even if people should fail you, Christ never will. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you neither leave us nor forsake us. You provide us the true way. That the, that the blessed man is not one who met, simply meditates on your law day and night. Not one who doesn't take refuge in you, but someone who does meditate on your word and takes their refuge in you. Help us to live in a way that is being more and more conformed to the image of your Son. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our final hymn is Wonderful Words of Life, hymn 697. Hymn 697, and we'll sing the, fir the first and the third verse. The first and the third verse of hymn 697. Stand with me as we sing.